G'day everyone and welcome to Art After Hours Online here at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. My name is Benjamin Law and I'm so privileged and honoured to be joining you here tonight from Gadigal land. The Gadigal of the Eora Nation, like First Nations people across this continent, have been sharing stories, sharing knowledge and making art here for tens of thousands of years. The oldest continuing human civilization this planet has ever seen and I'm particularly grateful to Elders past and present that we can continue sharing knowledge and making art here on what is and what will always be Aboriginal land. Now, Art After Hours, if you haven't joined us before, is a weekly talk series where you hear from artists and thinkers and celebrities in conversation as they explore themes and artworks from the exhibitions currently on display here at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. In this series of live online this year conversations, we go behind the scenes to find out this year's stories behind all of these canvases. And right now at the gallery, we're talking about the Sulman, the Wynn and the Archibald Prizes. Now, most of you are probably familiar with the Archibald Prizes. Um, every year since 1921, artists have entered the prize with portraits of politicians and celebrities, sporting heroes, artists, business people and more. It's the who's who of Australian culture. And every year, everyone who sees the Archibald Prize also sees the incredible entrants and winners of the Wynn and Sulman Prizes, which take place at exactly the same time. The Wynn Prize is awarded for the year's best landscape, paint, landscape painting of Australian scenery or the best example of figure sculpture. And the Sulman Prize is awarded for the best subject painting, genre painting or mural project. And our guest today, or tonight, is this year's winner of the Sulman Prize, judged by Cardam Ali. She was born in Melbourne to Filipino migrants and now lives and works in Western Sydney. She completed a Bachelor of Medical Science and then a Master's of Fine Art, and her work has since been exhibited in galleries across the country, including the Kasula Powerhouse Art Centre, Blacktown Art Centre, the Mossman Art Gallery, and of course, the Art Gallery of New South Wales. She's a recipient of the Sam Whiteley Commendation Award in the Churchy Emerging Art Prize and has been a finalist in both the Archibald and the Sulman Prize before. And of course, this year, she's now won the Sulman Award with her painting, The Divine. Marikit Santiago, welcome and congratulations. Thank you. Oh my gosh, this painting behind you um, is this year's winner. Um, it's so gorgeous. And I really want to talk about the painting, but before we do, I want to take you back to the night that you won, um, because you give this really fantastic speech. And I hope this isn't weird, but I'm going to read some of it back to you. Oh, that is so weird, go on. <laughs> but you did say, I hope that the communities to which I belong feel represented when they see my work. I hope it speaks to the Filipino community, the biracial kids growing up with multiple cultural identities, young artists in Western Sydney, and the artists who are mothers. I hope they feel supported and accepted when they see work from someone like me hung on the walls on the Art Gallery of New South Wales. I mean, look, when I heard that, I was like, <laughs> always in tears myself. I'm like, I'm not related to this person, but I feel like I've been embraced and taken into her family. And family, oh, is such a key part of your work. Family and community is such a key part of your work. So I'm really curious, tell, tell me more about your family. Um, my family really, oh, I should start by saying that when I was growing up, and part of the reason why I said that in my speech was that when I was growing up, I really wanted to be a doctor. I didn't want to be an artist. I didn't mm. think it was going to be part of my future. It was just going to be this thing that I like to do on the side. And my parents really supported my ambition to be a doctor. Um, but then once I started medical science and realised that it wasn't for me, mm. um, my parents weren't quite as supportive <laughs> of me leaving medical science. And they were like the classic Filipino, you know, you've got to finish what you start. Um, and so I finished that bloody degree and then, <laughs> <laughs> and then went and did um, and went, went into art school. Mm -hmm. And... Um, even though it wasn't what my parents wanted me to do, they were still really supportive mm. and have continued to be supportive this whole time. And my practice really relies on them. So my parents look after my children mm. um, so that I can work in the studio. My husband has been installing for me this whole time. 
Um, he, and, and my children and my husband are the subjects of my work. And recently I've engaged with my kids to make my work. So I feel like my family is really very much part of my practice in terms of process um, and, and even just, you know, the logistics of being an art artist and putting work up and having exhibitions and, you know, making it to talks like this tonight. So it's very much, like, they're very much part of, part of my art practice. So as much as you're an award-winning artist, you've also started a, a small family business. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Basically, yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is really beautiful that not only your family features in your art, but are so involved in your practice and making it work. Um, but in this painting, in particular, The Divine, that, that's won this year's Sulman Prize, it's three of your children, is that right? Yep. So tell me about your kids um, who feature in the work. Um, this piece is, is actually really special to me because it's the first and so far the only painting that I have of the three children. Um, and it was the first one that I made after, um, I guess, finishing up a period of maternity leave. It was, it was a way for me to get out mm. of maternity leave and back into the studio. Um, I, it took some time to get going because I really wanted to get the right um, photograph of each each child to work on, mm. um, and that that took ages because <laughs> it's like, <laughs> guys, just sit there, don't smile. And if you tell a child not to smile, then you get these ones, you get them. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then trying to figure out how to work while still breastfeeding. Mm. Um, and, you know, like negotiating being away from, from a new baby and, and spending that special time. But, yeah, it's a kind of weird thing to, to negotiate, like feeling a little bit guilty that ah, I just want to get out to the studio. And then when, I'm, when I am working, I'm like, should I be spending more time with the kids? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's a, it's a real... And, and I feel so honoured to have won this prize with a painting of them that I've made with them. Um, so, yeah. It's... I want to I want to um, pick up on that later on about the fact that you've made it with them because they're not only the subjects of the work, but they have been part of the process mm. itself um, too. So, process and practicalities. I want to park that for a second. But when you came into painting this particular painting, was there kind of a, a mission statement as to why you were painting? them what did you want to bring out in this painting because as you said before it's the first time that you had painted the three of them mm. in a work together is that right yeah um i guess as a parent you know i feel i feel this overwhelming sense of pressure that i have to be a model of virtue and you know all of that for for my children but sometimes you really just want to be an asshole but then you've got <laughs> these three people that are looking up to you so it's like Maybe, you know, you've got to reel in your asshole a little, <laughs> a little bit. Um, but then it made me think about um, what's inherited by our children mm. um, and the Christian doctrine of original sin that all mankind have, have inherited the sin of Adam and Eve. Mm. Um, so then what's inherited by my children? So they, have they inherited my physical semblance? Do they, have they inherited some of my character traits or have they indeed inherited my sin? Um, mm. So then there is that pressure to be, um, you know, an upstanding citizen. And, um, but at the same time, you know, for all the sins that I've committed, there's nothing quite like parenthood that absolves you of that and kind of mm. gives you that second life. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's really interesting that there's a kind of a response to Christian narrative going on in your work. Is that something that features throughout your practice? Yeah. Um, as a Filipino, I've been brought up in a Catholic, mm. in the Catholic faith, and as with my Filipino ethnicity, I've also kind of rejected my Catholic, my Catholic, um, I don't know, not upbringing, but yeah, I, I feel like the more I reject something, mm. and the more that I investigate or articulate that rejection in my work, I actually come to realise that I am mm. that, like. I've been, I worked so hard in my childhood to reject being Filipino mm -hmm. and making that part of my practice that I'm like, oh, I'm pretty Filo. Like, <laughs> like for the announcement opening, I wore the traditional Filipino, um, uh, I think well, we call it a barong. Mm. Um, and I'm like, man, that's really Filo. So the same with Catholicism. I'm like, 
yeah, I'm not a practicing Catholic. Mm -hmm. and, but then I'm like, but I've still, we got married in a church. We did the whole mass. We baptized our children um, as soon as we could at six weeks. Mm -hmm. And we say prayers with the kids every night as part of this family tradition. So I'm kind of like, oh no, Catholicism is only a family tradition. It's just to uphold the traditions that, um, that I liked in my childhood. So the okay. Christmas and the Easter getting together. But is that not faith? Like, is that not Catholic faith? So I'm kind of in that weird sort of tension of like, oh, I'm rejecting it, but I'm still, you know, um, upholding a lot of these traditions and passing them on to the next yeah. generation. Well, I imagine it's a process, right? Like, you've got a lot of questions about it and what better way to work out mm. questions than through art yeah. and through storytelling. And I think that's really where my art is, is, has found a really fertile ground, is to find all of these questions that ha don't have any answers and find this place of uncertainty and discomfort. Yeah. And that's where I make my best work, mm. I think. Like, my most interesting work is where things find a place where things don't make sense. Yeah. Um, I really like getting behind the scenes of work. And with this painting in particular, we're not just looking at something with um, traditional forms of like acrylic and, and just oil. There's like a lot going on here as well. Uh, and as much as, of course, you're the artist, you said your three kids contributed as subjects, but also contributed to mm. the work itself. Tell me about how you even start a piece like this and what the process is like. Um, actually, the first person who put the brush to, to the, well, it's not a canvas, it's plywood, was my eldest daughter, Maella. <laughs> um, so she, and was that planned? Was that yeah, intentional? Yeah. Well, I, so I'll draw up the, um, the outlines and then I'll ask her to come in and just paint. Uh, and some, sometimes, depending on the, the, the piece, I'll ask her, because now she's at an age where she does draw representationally, mm. if that's a word. Yeah. Um, where sometimes I'll be like, just do your shapes, do whatever you feel like. Um, and sometimes I'll be like, I want you to paint leaves or flowers or whatever. Um, but for this particular piece, I just kind of let her just go for it. Um, and is that kind of like a likes. ceremonial thing, like putting a champagne bottle against a new <laughs> ship before it sails out to harbour? Or? Um, Maybe it's becoming that way because <laughs> with this particular painting, the children like began it and finished it. Mm. So the very first layer and the very last layer are theirs. Well, I mean, look, I hear that and I'm like, that sounds really sweet, but it also <laughs> gets my heart rate up because it's like, if you finished a painting that that's beautiful, what are a bunch of three kids going <laughs> to do to it? So are there like rules and parameters of yeah, what they're allowed to it's do? It's somewhat controlled. Okay. Um, and with, with my youngest, I mean, her her participation was purely, you know, tokenistic because mm. she she at the time she wasn't one yet or she was just one, so it was really just putting the pen in her hand and just like carrying her <laughs> around the canvas, like you can draw there, but not there. Yeah. Um, but the other two, I can sort of uh, I can give them sort of guidelines. I'm like, just make sure you don't draw on your face, mm -hmm. and they're kind of like, yeah, I don't want to draw on my face. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, one of the other things that I really wanted to pick up on was the practicalities of how you're making your work because I know that there are often double standards when we talk to male creatives and if they're a parent, they're not often asked about, mm. like, how do you balance parenting yeah. and your work? You know, like, I think there is that double standard. But I do think the fact that you brought it up and the fact that your kids are also such an enmeshed part of your work does make me curious about... Um, you know, they're, they're quite young. You say you were balancing breastfeeding <laughs> at the same time. Can you tell me about the rhythms of your practice, not just with this painting, but just how you work um, to make work still? Um, well, with my eldest at school now, I've kind of, I've got a very short window to be productive. So it's between drop off and pick up. And in between that time, there are household duties as well. So I probably get about three-ish hours a day, four days a week to make work. Mm -hmm. um, and then that, I have that, that, that doesn't seem like that long. It's not that long. Um, and I work in the garage of our two-bedroom apartment. So... Um, Where does your car go? On the street. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I share the garage space with, like, all the storage of, like, the kids' bikes and their old clothes. The stuff that's in a typical garage. Exactly, right. yeah. Um, so it's limited space. And then this work is not, like, it's a significant size, something like this as well. So how does that physically work? Is that a challenge? Well, I, I made this work on two panels of ply, 
which I didn't fix until until the end because I'm short. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and it gave me um, enough space to work on sections at a time um, so I, I, I wouldn't have to go all the way up to the top and I wouldn't need that whole space all of the time. Mm. Um, and that's part of the reason why I work on cardboard as well. Cardboard, I can fold it. Um, it's easy to carry. I get lots of it for free. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. So I've, I've got to work with limited time, limited space. Um, but it's really, I mean, I'm not saying it like I'm complaining about it. It's just, this is how I've found my most productive way to be an artist and a parent at the same time. Mm. Um, if I'm working at home, then I can still stay on top of some household duties and I can still be available for my kids to drop them off and pick them up from school or go to the you know, performances. Um, yeah. And if, some, if someone needs to come home sick, I can, I can be there. So this is kind of, I found this is the best way for me to, um, to make work and not compromise the kind of mother that I want to be for the kids. So there is this kind of perception, especially from outside the art world, and maybe within the art world as well, that you need to kind of like be in uh, a zone space that the artist, you know, waits for their muse <laughs> to come. You don't necessarily have that luxury, but ain't no zone, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> it's like once I get in, like my three hours start, I'm on. I have no time to be messing around on Instagram or or like figuring out Spotify playlists. It's like just go. <laughs> so a disciplined, regimented work structure can work, um, and in fact, can produce great art. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm driven. I want to, I've made, it's, I feel like I've kind of taken a, a, a risk for my family. Like it's been a long time for me to work up to this point. I've worked really hard um, and I haven't earned, like, you know, I, have, I feel like I haven't contributed, contributed financially to my family. So I feel like this is my way of like, you know, I, I, I have to, I have to give this a hundred, like for my family. Yeah. Um, and like my husband's never made me feel guilty about not contributing. He's so supportive. But just for me, I, I feel that guilt on myself. Like sometimes, you know, on particularly difficult, difficult days as an artist when you get a lot of disappointment or you don't, you know, you get, you get hit with like six rejection emails in a row and I just kind of think, why didn't I just stick with the medicine thing? Or mm. why didn't I get into architecture with my dad? Like nepotism would have been so much easier <laughs> than, than, than an art practice. So um, yeah, I kind of feel that for my family, for the kids, and to show the kids that you can make, you can make your dream happen. Mm. Um, I have to, I don't want to half ass any of it. I don't want to half ass being a mum and I don't want to half ass being a, being a parent. So. This is my thing. Look, I don't want to assume anything, but I feel like maybe winning the Sulman Prize might have, <laughs> might have changed things up. Yeah, definitely. And, and thinking of your family as well, you know, who have been there. And we're both migrant background kids and um, pursuing a creative field within that realm can sometimes come with its own kind of cultural baggage. But now that you've actually won, like, I'm so curious, what was that day like when you heard the news? How did you react? How did the people around you react? Um, it was like a super hectic, amazing day. <laughs> so I had just dropped off my eldest at school mm -hmm. and I, was, I dropped off my youngest to my dad so that I could take my middle boy to swimming. And I was in that in-between period of the day when I got my, the phone call from Michael Brand. And it was just, it was amazing. And I was speechless. And then I got off the phone, I'm like, okay, I need to reschedule this day. <laughs> so then the next phone call I made was to cancel swimming. Mm -hmm. And then the phone call after that was to say to school, I'm picking up my daughter. Can't tell you why till midday, but I'm going to have to take her out of school. And then it all just was this big whirlwind. And um, yeah, a really special day to spend with my family. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And I felt like... Um, it wasn't my. It wasn't just my win. It was the whole family's win. Like with the kids, my husband, my my family. My, Imagine. My parents I mean, and my it's sister. one. It's one thing to win a major art prize and what that must mean to any family of the artist, but to actually have your family in the art and involved in the art itself must be so special. It was really special. Like, um, because I was in the I was in the Sulman Prize last year with a mm. portrait of my mum, and she was like, um, we were all very proud. And she was really, she was pretty stoked with herself. <laughs> but then to, to win with uh, this piece, which is like 
really personal um, and is indicative of a really intimate time where we just completed our family really we're, we're, we have, we've, we've got we've got three kids and that's going to be our family yeah and this is kind of the first piece that kind of indicates that it has the three of them complete because I have painted my children before mm. and have painted them with my husband but now I look at those paintings and go there's someone missing mm. so now this is the first one where I don't have to have that feeling anymore where mm. it's like this is this is our complete family and then to have that little winner sticker <laughs> underneath is ah. just really really incredibly special so gorgeous that it marks a place and time like that what's going to happen to the painting after the exhibition i'm going to keep it <laughs> you're going to keep this i can imagine i can imagine that you'd want to but you decided that early on i imagine um when i made it yeah so i made it with the intention that it would stay with us mm. yeah yeah i want to talk about this painting of your mum because you said mm. you've been a finalist in the Sulman prize before you're not a stranger to this exhibition and this contest so this is your mum uh and it was a piece that was a finalist for the Sulman prize in 2019. uh tell me tell me about your mum and why you wanted to paint her and how you've painted her um my mum is the classic you know filipina nanai that just cares for everyone and cooks for everyone. And um, I painted her in the role of Venus. So this painting is an appropriation of Botticelli's Primavera. And she stands in place of, of Venus. And she, for me, stands in place of all the standards of womanhood that, at, that I look up to. So she's my role model for, for motherhood, for womanhood. Um, but there are some things that, um, from her generation, that she kind of still, I don't know, I guess enables the patriarchy in a way. And I think that's just, um, that's just indicative of the, uh, the generation of the culture that she grew up in the patriarchal society of the Philippines. Mm. Um, but in our household, she's boss. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so her gaze is averted to sort of, which is, which is how um, women in Western classical paintings are portrayed, mm. um, always a gaze averted. So I've painted her in that, in that similar way, but when I paint myself, my gaze always meets the viewer. Mm. Um, I'm more defiant than she is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I want to talk about another piece because you're not only a, uh, not a stranger to the Sulman Prize, you've also been a finalist in the Archibald Prize mm -hmm. as well. Um, and this portrait was a finalist in the prize in 2016. Tell me about this painting and who you've painted. Um, so this is a portrait of a very good friend of mine, Ramesh Nithyendran. We did our honours year together at art school mm -hmm. and we became really close. Um, and I painted him at a time where his career was really picking, picking up. And he'd, when, when we were at art school together, he was known for drawing and painting. Um, but then he really made a name for himself in ceramics. And so I painted him at that time where he's, he really picked up um, in his ceramics. And the time that I painted his piece, I was pregnant with my second. Mm. And um, it was the first time I'd entered the Archibald. And I had, I think, just a few weeks to get this painting out before, before I was about to give birth. So I had, I had that time frame. I was like, let's get, let's get one out before. Wow, before that is I a chicken <laughs> clock. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is yeah. a deadline. Um, so yeah, that, I think that piece kind of is quite special to me as well because mm. first, time, first time I'd entered and then I got selected. Wow. So, um, and then, yeah, it just reminds me of that time where I really wanted to keep making work during my pregnancy um, and you know, made this piece of Ramesh. Yeah. Yeah. Look, this is a very interesting year for the Archibald Sulman and Win Prizes. Um, obviously, we're talking here virtually because we can't necessarily do this as a live event because mm. of COVID. Um, COVID's been a hard year for a lot of people in the arts. How has COVID affected, for better or for worse, your practice? Um, it at the start when we when we were all in lockdown and all the schools were closed, it was. It was hard, but not that hard in a way. Um, it was hard in terms of, like, it was hard for me to make work. I had to just put it aside. And I was at this weird time where um, this, the exhibitions that I had lined up were kind of, we were still kind of thinking how, what's, what's, what's gonna happen. So I was like, do I keep making work? Or, you know, like, how, do I wait for the postponement? But it turned out I couldn't make work while I was homeschooling my oldest anyway. 
Um, but then it meant that we were all at home together mm. and, you know, we went on lots of neighborhood walks and the three kids had to, like, had to, <laughs> got to um, <laughs> play together all the time. And yeah. my youngest is, was getting to the age where she could participate. So she was like one and a half. Um, and she could participate with her elder siblings rather than just be the, you know, the baby that's just lying on the floor and, yeah, just the ornament. Whereas, like, she kind of really inserted herself into her siblings' games. And, you know, my eldest learnt how to ride a bike without training wheels, which we probably wouldn't have done if we weren't home and, you know, in the driveway all the time. That sounds all pretty charmed, actually. Yeah! <laughs> yeah, I mean, I often think about, you know, the parallel universe in which COVID didn't happen. I hope they're having fun over there, who are, you know, in that <laughs> universe. But, you know, in that parallel universe, Maine Wyatt may not have painted the self-portrait that won the Packing Room Prize at the Archibald. You know, that was a COVID-era project for him. What, what about this painting? Was this always going to be made? Well, this, was, this painting was made for um, a show that I had planned, a solo show that I had scheduled for June at 4A. Um, that got postponed due to COVID. Mm. Um, and the original submission dates for the Archibald were going to clash with, um, with, the, with my 4A show. So I wasn't going to enter. I wasn't going to be able to enter this piece in, in, the, in wow. the prize. Yeah, if, if, all those da- if we were in this alternate world, we, I wouldn't have been here. My, my painting wouldn't be hung there. Yeah, the other sliding doors version of yeah. you in that yep. non-COVID world, mm. this piece isn't here. Yep. Wow. I think I said that in my, in my um, acceptance speech that that's part, like another reason why it was such a thrill because I wasn't meant to be able to enter yeah. this year. Well, look, we're going to wrap up soon, but going back to your acceptance speech, you know, when you talk about all these people, all these communities to which you belong and now you also represent, I'm wondering, you know, when it comes to the Filipino community in Australia, biracial kids who are growing up with multiple uh, multiple cultural identities, artists in Western Sydney, artists who are mothers, artists who might have started with medical science <laughs> but, um, before thinking, actually, this is what I want to do. Do you have any advice to them if they want to participate meaningfully in the arts? Um, yeah, what would your oh, advice be? I don't know about any advice. Um, I just... Anything that you wish you knew when you were starting on this path? I wish, you know now? I wish I knew that you can, like right at the start, that you can make it work as an artist, that it's a viable career. Um, and I mean, with anything, you have to work really, really hard, but that's with anything. Um, I kind of wish I knew that rather than, I kind of was brought up with, oh, you know, you'll never make any money as an artist, which is sometimes true. Sure. Um, but yeah, I think I wish I had known right from the start that, it's that being an artist isn't just a childhood fantasy. When you ask kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they say an artist. I don't think we should discount that as that's just a childhood fantasy. Mm. Um, and, you know, for me now, I think my childhood fantasy has become the doctor and my reality is being an artist. So mm. you can make it happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I, and surely with, you know, the young Archies as well has shown how important it is for young people to participate in art, that that's a realistic yeah. thing that they should be involved in. Yeah. And that artists make a, you know, a very, um, will make a really good contribution to the community as well. Mm. Yeah. Now, we've seen a few of the people that you've painted, your three children, your mother, they've been exhibited. Anyone on your wish list? Oh, I don't know. I think I'm going to keep painting my family. I think that's really part of, um, that's really embedded in my practice. But I think if I could sort of like look forward and just kind of see what's, what's in the future, I just, I wonder how long my kids are going to keep making art with me. Mm. That's, that's my big question, I think, is that like, how long are they going to pose for me? Because I feel like with my son, it's, it's expiring. Um, so, yeah. Well, surely you're the mum and you can decide for <laughs> them, right? <laughs> you're doing this. <laughs> Marik at Santiago, it's, so, it's such a pleasure to be here with your work and to talk about it. Um, thank you for sharing not only your work, but your family with us as well. It's such a pleasure. Thank you. Congratulations. Thanks. Um, Marik at Santiago is this year's winner of the Sulman Prize here at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. And the 2020 Archibald Win and Sulman Prize exhibitions 
are on display here at the gallery until the 10th of January. So you all have plenty of time to get here from here across the summer holidays. The gallery is open from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. daily, and you don't need a ticket or a pre-booking to see the general collection here at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, but you do need to book if you specifically want to see the Archibald Wynn and Sulman prizes. And you can hop to the gallery website for details. Art After Hours is supported by Macquarie, Macquarie University and the Art Gallery Society of New South Wales. I'm Benjamin Law. Thank you so much for joining us.